Hey guys, uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Morris Panner, and uh, I'm really excited today to be partnering with Sim to bring you a webinar on moving to the cloud, um, current trends uh, impacting how we really do our, our job. And what's kind of fun about today is I get to do a, a little bit of a brief intro on, on some of what all of us, I think, are seeing in, in the world, particularly in the COVID world, and then turn it over to three great women leaders. And uh, very excited, Chantelle Hopper, who, who recently joined our senior management team as the VP of customer success, is going to moderate and share what I think in some ways she gets to do every day, which is work with great leaders like Elise at St. Luke's and Amina at Penn, and also some interesting insights from her work at, at Rad Aid. So Elise Thomas and Amina Alahi, who I'm privileged to call colleagues and friends, I think you'll get a chance to learn more about their backgrounds, but you're in for a dynamic webinar today, learning how people who have to deliver um, cutting edge solutions do so by overcoming some of the obstacles. And I think that's gonna be a little bit of a theme of today that if it were easy, everybody would do it. And you're gonna hear from people who know it's not easy and do it anyway. So that's, that's kind of an exciting piece. So just a logistical note, um, this is a system that lets you ask questions with a little Q&A bar. And if you do so, we will do our best to answer them. Regardless, we will get um, questions answered one way or another. People will are generous with their time and will follow up if you don't get a chance to, to have your question addressed on the webinar. Also, if you are taking notes on the slides, uh, you don't need to do that. We will get you the slide presentation um, after after the webinar. So any data that's on the slide, don't worry about that. You'll have access to all of that. There's some fun statistics in there and you'll just have that um, at your disposal. So let's uh, kick it off. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of driving to the cloud? It is kind of become one of those buzzword compliant concepts that is really um, more than that. And I think what we're starting to see and why it's so much fun to be in imaging right now is data driving better outcomes. That's really, if you had to say one thing about it, it's not that we like to manage large amounts of data, it's that we are being able to impact outcomes by taking data and bringing it to patients because patient engagement is super important and to physicians so that we're able to get better practices out of that, and then to the care team writ large. And all of that we've seen with the explosion in telehealth. But for those of us who deal with imaging, we know that imaging is, is really where the rubber meets the road when you're talking about any kind of chronic condition or any kind of advanced health condition. Once you move into that part of the world, there's a whole different set of challenges around accessibility, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And it's turning everything on its ear and turning the traditional infrastructure in some ways as just kind of endpoints on a network. And that's what really is becoming exciting about uh, our world today. So the dramatic uh, amounts of data, I, I love to give numbers like this, mostly because I don't even know what they mean. They're so big that I don't even know what they mean. And so it's kind of fun to talk about that much data. Uh, but also it's the uh, depth and richness of data. And I think Elise will talk a little bit about this. I mean, we're not talking about, I don't want to say just radiological images, but we're talking about complete data packages that really involve much more than that integrate with the EMR, uh, integrate with different ologies. Really, the vision is starting to be realized. And why do we do all this? Because uh, when I walk in as a patient, I feel better about the care I'm going to get. And all of us um, uh, have had healthcare experiences that are tricky. And uh, Elise was just talking as we were warming up, and I don't know all the details, and not to blast her personal business, as I guess I am, out to the whole world. But, you know, she's had to deal with just imminently some personal health care challenges and to be able to get the data in an actionable way makes all the difference and not just for the care provider but for the family and for the patient. Agreed. 
So telehealth industry trends, these are fun trends that um, actually, I, you know, is, uh, this is this is a slide actually that if you've been watching the stock market, you know this is already happening as you watch what's happened in telehealth. But also fundamentally, I think it reflects the fact that all of us now are working in a new way, in a different way. And that means that um, we are going to need to adjust how we interact on that pyramid of healthcare because a video visit is fantastic, but then where do you go from there? Um, and that's what we're really going to talk about today. So at this point, um, and this may be my uh, last slide before I turn it over to Chantel, or actually I have one more after this, um, but this one is sort of the warm up to getting into the panel. And it really is talking about the idea of what is it that we're trying to do operationally? So we went from the 30,000 foot view, we know we need to be there, but now what I love about this panel is they have now solved these problems or in the middle fighting how to solve them and how to make them better. And I guess it's fair to say they don't solve them because as soon as you solve something, it opens up a new challenge. And that is sort of the nature of uh, why it's also fun to be in this field, maybe also a little stressful, but super fun. So we're going to hear about AI, not in kind of a buzzwordy way, but what is it that people are asking for and how can you, how can you take all that data and start to make it available to the people who need it. And uh, this truly is my last slide, and I think it's a good place for me to, uh, to leave it, which is with the patient. I think one of the things that I um, have loved about being in this field is I have never, and maybe this is just luck, or maybe this is really the depth of commitment in the industry, I've never met anybody who doesn't understand that why they are doing this is because of a patient. And they really, um, uh, you know, I've met uh, people who can be upset or they can be cranky or they can be disappointed or they can be anything else. But if you bring it back to the patient at the end of the day, everybody remembers why they uh, did this. And I think that patients are, um, I even actually like to change this word sometimes. I like to change this to consumers because I like to think of all of us as, um, you know, kind of patience and waiting, which is, I guess, kind of a negative way to think about it. But I wanna be a um, person treated with dignity. I wanna have control over what I'm doing. And then guess what? It turns out that I'll probably get a better outcome and I'll probably uh, make my hospital look better if I'm more engaged and I'll make my care provider look better. So. All of that is um, something I think everybody is focused on. And we have, again, good examples of how patients are embracing things. At one point, somebody said to me, why does a patient need to have access to imaging? They can't really understand it. I, I just haven't found that to be the experience. They aren't pretending to be uh, a diagnostic radiologist, but they love to have control of their healthcare data and it really helps um, make them feel like they're in the driver's seat. And we all know that if just personally, that's where all of us, I think, like to be. So with that, um, I'm super excited to turn it over to three dynamic women leaders who uh, uh, will, I think help us understand what we need to do and then I know be available to uh, talk about their own experiences and knowing them as I do, they will, I think, give you guys some real great tips and be there to do the follow-up so that you can be successful as well. So thank you very much. Awesome, Morris. Thank you so much. That was a great setup for what I know will be a very um, content-rich discussion ahead of us. Um, before we dive into some of the panel questions, I did want to take some time to introduce our fabulous panelists for today. So first we have Amina Elahi, who is a senior technical analyst um, at Penn Medicine. So she has implemented imaging applications, AI software, um, and currently administers their electronic uh, image sharing application. Um, uh, she has worked really closely as well with RadAid. Um, and actually did a two-week project in Nigeria deploying a friendship PAX installation and um, has since then joined the RAD-Aid leadership team um, as the informatics program manager to pursue her, pursue her passion for global outreach uh, and improving healthcare for all, which I know is something that all of us um, can get behind. So 
thrilled to have Amina uh, on the webinar today. Um, so thank you in advance. Um, and then next we have Elise Thomas. So Elise is the lead uh, radiology and cardiology IT. She leads a, a big team over at St. Luke's University Health Network. Um, uh, she has planned and executed uh, many successful radiology models for enterprise EMR implementations at nine hospitals uh, while working very cross-functionally across the organization. I have personally seen Elise not only um, implement but also create innovative ways to integrate systems at her institution, um, which just shows the vast amount of experience that she has in this domain and how she's able to apply that at St. Luke's and truly yield a very successful program. So thank you, Elise, for being on, on board today. Um, and I guess we'll go ahead and dive into our panel discussion. Again, just as a reminder to everybody that is tuned in right now, we'd love to hear from you. So please write in some questions. We're gonna take some time at the end to hear from you all and make sure that we get some, the, the content out that you're hoping to see. So with that, our first question, uh, I would be remiss not to open up a panel in, this, in these times without somehow referencing COVID. So our first panel question of today is around telehealth. Um, and do you all think that uh, telehealth solutions that have been adopted in COVID-19 will have a, lasted, a lasting impact on healthcare? And I guess even before we answer that, I would personally love to hear just at your organizations what you have seen implemented in the telehealth realm um, it's a kind of a comment on how effective it's been and, and sort of speaking towards whether you think that will sort of withstand beyond COVID. So Elise, why don't we kick this one off with you? Well, I can tell you, you know, telehealth was a huge impact during COVID at St. Luke's University Health Network. We um, had about 1,200 visits a month and we exceeded over 150,000 visits uh, during COVID, which is uh, amazing. Amazing team. Um, they readied everybody up. They got it deployed. Um, mental health was a big televisit market for us with people and what they were experiencing during uh, COVID um, in order to just make sure the patients were being taken care of. Um, they had numerous cases of, of patients that um, really just canceled because they were afraid to go in and they were able to maintain those patients' care um, remotely, which was huge. Um, I think the lasting impact is gonna be really driven by reimbursement. Will the reimbursement still be there um, if, it's continued that people really can implement the virtual visit for, um, you know, uh, med, you know, getting your renewal for your meds. Uh, can a telehealth visit, you know, be, be acceptable and will the reimbursement still be there for the institution in order to go forward and, and, and have those virtual visits is, is kind of where I think it's going to fall. Just a quick follow-up, Elise. I'm curious, you mentioned you had a ton of telehealth visits. Mm -hmm. What did you see as some of the biggest challenges from the patient side? Was there resistance in adoption? Were people very open to it? And I'd love to know if there's anything that you all did to sort of promote or encourage that the telehealth um, option as opposed to the traditional one. Yeah, I think St. Luke's is just amazing. We're, we're, you know, we were a small community hospital. We've grown into a 11 hospital health system, but we're really embedded within the community. So it was our promotion, our marketing. It was our physicians. Our physicians wouldn't allow their patients to knowing that they had um, some, you know, uh, uh, medical issues to not reach out and make sure that they were following their care, making sure they were getting their health maintenance. Um, so, you know, I really, I really give um, all the, the dedication to the people that I work with. Um, and uh, they really did follow up and make sure that our patients were being taken care of during COVID. Um, so it really was amazing to watch it happen um, because the adoption, everybody was like, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, I could tell you a neighbor down the street, um, they, they did it and they, they were amazed. A prescription was called in, they were able to pick it up in 10 minutes and they felt that they were taken care of. They, they rated it uh, one of the best experiences they had and they didn't have to leave wow. the house. Yeah, so it really did make an impact on, on people. That's fantastic. Amina, over at Penn, what sort of telehealth trends did you see emerge as a, I guess, out of necessity during COVID? And what are your thoughts on how, how long they'll last? So the biggest trend that I was excited about was getting more permanent image sharing connections. You know, sometimes in the past, 
um, people were wary to you know, share studies electronically or they were just flat out no. Other times it took you know, over a year for people who were interested to actually you know, put forth the effort um, and share studies with us. You know, a few weeks into the pandemic, we were creating more and more permanent image sharing connections. You know, nobody wants to see um, patients travel. Um, sometimes I'll hear stories of patients traveling an hour and a half to drop off a disc because we couldn't receive the studies electronically. Um, so that was definitely um, one of my largest highlights. And that's great because those connections will definitely persist post COVID. And so it's awesome to see that this sort of moment in time was a, a good catalyst in, in um, kind of gaining some momentum on those. Um, fantastic. Any other comments on, on, on telehealth and, and its persistence before we move on to the next question? Well, I would like to see in the future, I think um, we have a huge opportunity to use platforms like Teams or Zoom in order to figure out how to take pictures of the wound and put it into a VNA. Uh, see the growth of um, something that's going on on, on an actual medical level, but get it in, into a platform that you can follow it. Follow uh, blood sugars electronically somehow by letting the patient have an app in order to download it right into the EMR. I think we saw, at, especially at St. Luke's, we saw a lot of those trends happening and a lot of innovation. So I think telehealth has also pushed a lot of companies to start thinking outside the box, which is awesome. That's awesome. I apologize for preemptively changing the slide, but I think you make a great point. I think before we go into our next question, we're going to launch a quick poll. Um, so the poll today is, does your organization plan to expand on telehealth solutions adopted during COVID-19? The uh, possibilities are yes, we are actively working towards increased health, telehealth capabilities. No, we are satisfied with our current telehealth capabilities. And the third option is we have not yet implemented a telehealth solution. So we'll leave that up for a couple seconds and then we'll go ahead and, um, and move on. All right. I don't think, all right, just some quick results. I think this is really interesting. Um, pretty much 80% of people said we are actively working towards increased telehealth capabilities with the other basically 20% saying that they had not yet implemented a telehealth solution. So definitely the majority in the bucket of kind of not just stopping where we are now, but working towards seeing ever increasing opportunities or offerings rather in the future. Great. So next questions. Uh, I feel like we are always talking about integrated systems, integrated IT systems, integrated processes. Um, I know that you know, both of you have experience in sort of integrated systems, although it might mean something different for, for both of you. But from your perspective, how, how do integrated systems benefit healthcare organizations? How have you seen an integrated system benefit your organization um, as well? Amina, why don't we start with you on this one? Sure, so, you know, one of the best benefits to integrating systems is simply that it provides a more efficient way for end users to review records and enter data. And we see that as we're able to, you know, launch um, APIs from our um, EMR. Nobody wants to open up the reinforced systems in order to access one patient's records. Yeah. And then it also becomes, you know, a matter of safety. Um, so last year when I um, made the trip to Nigeria um, to install the Red Aid Friendship Packs, we discovered that the reporting system being used at the time was not integrated into their packs. Um, so reports were either accessed separately and interpretations were sometimes lost due to inadequate storage. But now with their new packs, they have a built-in reporting system and a recording feature, which makes the dissertation process so much smoother and a secure way to actually save those reports. Wow, yeah, that is definitely another perspective on integrated systems, not just as a benefit, but as a way to prevent a potentially harmful outcome, which it's definitely something to think about. Um, Elise, from your perspective, I know integrated systems are, are, are very uh, at the forefront at St. Luke's. And so I would love to hear from you about how sort of, you know, what maybe what you've deployed and also how, how it's benefited St. Luke's. Yeah, we're, we were the first in um, the United States to take 
um, Epic's module of Lumens, uh, Indoworks was sun sunsetted by Olympus, and we worked with Ombra in order to create that custom API so that our physicians no longer on the GI space had to go into another third party system to do that dictation. And they're able to now bring in those pictures mm -hmm. um, directly into the report, just like they did in the Indoworks system. Um, so it really was an amazing um, to be a part of that working on the interoperability piece with Ombra and the uh, Lumens images, but it just goes to show you how patient or physician satisfaction goes through the roof, right? Because they no longer have to go here and then go there and then document here and document there. But I also think that um, one of the primary factors that most people during COVID have figured out is cost. The more you are able to integrate systems and give your physicians a more streamlined um, way of working, you're going to see cost reduction. Um, you know, less servers, the more third, you might find a third party that is amazing at doing one thing, but if you can find a third party company um, that can be interoperative, you know, and get in with the other systems, then you get a whole package. Um, so I think we find that a lot at St. Luke's that, you know, the cost is, is going to become a thing of the future with everything that happened during COVID. And then how do you make it efficient for your physician, which also helps with cost, right? The more mm -hmm. efficient your physician is, the more uh, reimbursement he can get because it's the more patients he can take care of. So we see a lot at, a lot at St. Luke's with these integrated systems and, and what does the future hold um, coming out of COVID, coming out of the post-COVID um, you know, layoffs and, and, and people um, having to, you know, the reduction in staff. Yeah, I think that's an awesome point that, you know, the benefits are really not for one specific cohort of individuals, but, but thinking beyond your physician population, your tech staff, and how just benefiting them can even trickle down into sort of the next cohort of individuals, which might be your consumers, your patients, your referring physicians, and how that might affect them. Agreed. Yep. Yep. And during COVID with us, we did two pilots with two uh, major companies, Abbott being one and Massimo being another. We were the first to institute uh, Massimo's um, patient monitoring system. So the nurses and the doctors didn't have to be at risk every time going in that room with the COVID patient. So it was wow. just amazing to see the interoperability. I keep using that word because it, it really, it really truly signifies the way the future of healthcare is going. It's amazing. Amina, anything else to add to integrated systems before we move on to our next question? I completely agree that, you know, interoperability is really the key here. Um, two words you'll often hear me talk about is efficiency and simplicity. And if we're looking at this from not only a healthcare perspective, but as um, Elise pointed out, it's a business um, perspective. So if you save time by being efficient um, and utilizing resources properly and reducing, you know, manual workflows, you will also um, save money and be able to use those human resources in a different manner. Yep. For sure. Awesome. We will move on to the next question. So related, um, you know, we talk a lot about patient experience. Morris brought up the point about referring to patients really as consumers um, in this system. How, in your, from your guys' perspective, how can healthcare organizations use interoperable or integrated solutions um, to improve the patient experience. So sort of thinking about it from their perspective. Um, Elise, I will start with you on this one. Well, I'm, I'm hopefully uh, being on the Ombra user group, we've seen multiple people now integrate Ombra um, image sharing platform with uh, MyChart and Epic, and I know Cerner has a similar product. And to see the numbers that people are able to report with the patient experience improvement. Um, my, you know, the medical records department with the DIS and Amina brought that up, the CDs and driving them and the consults for, in my area, it's either New York or Philadelphia. And how do they get those images in a timely manner? How do you, with COVID, we can't come into the office. I, just, there's so many things out there to improve the patient experience. And um, as, you know, Morris, uh, alluded to in the beginning, I'm looking for more than radiology, cardiology. I'm trying to get us to the point where we can share multiple things. Um, uh, my CMIO asked me how to, how to share EEG files. 
um, get them up in the cloud and able to move them. And it's all for the patient experience. It's all for the collaboration of physicians to get that patient taken care of. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my goals is to help St. Luke's to get to that level where we have multiple things in there where our medical records, um, you know, people can just click one button and be able to send, you know, everything from, from one workflow and be able to have it be electronic where the patient doesn't have to come in, you know, um, and I think um, the as a whole, um, as a whole, you know, government-wise, healthcare-wise, we're working towards that. We just have to be able to get to that level. Yeah, it's so interesting that especially with COVID, part of improving the patient experience, a key component of that now is uh, eliminating the, the need for them to come in person, whether that's to right. get an image or a report or another visit. So that has almost become a core pillar of, of patient experience as we know it today. Okay. Um, Amina, over to you. Yes, um, I agree. Um, so I mentioned earlier about how it's difficult for some patients to travel in, um, but we also have to think about those patients in rural or, you know, and or low to medium income countries um, who can't travel at all and are sometimes put in charge of transferring images or oftentimes um, from one site to another, from one specialist to another, even within the same healthcare organization. I believe that uh, one way healthcare organizations can improve the patient experience is by, you know, ensuring that they adhere to the IHE interoperability standards. Definitely. And I know we have some questions on, on standards a little later on, so I definitely want to dig into that. Amina, I would love to dig in a little bit on this question, though, just from your perspective in working in Nigeria with RADAID. How did you see the patient experience improve with the, that work um, to kind of deploy these new systems that sort of were working better together? So one of the great things I was excited about is, you know, at the time they only had, you know, one CD burner um, where they would burn images. Um, again, they would give them to the patient who had to go, you know, across the corridor to take them to their specialist and try and do the studies or they would take them to another facility and they couldn't open that disc. Now, with the use of being able to just share a link, um, you know, with an outside facility or with their referring physician, um, life is just made so much easier. And they can, you know, if they had to burn a disc, they can do it from any um, computer now instead of just at one station. Right. So really, that very powerful point, the mobility of the data um, and how, how that, even though the patient really isn't seeing it, it's really not their ownership in that scenario, just making it more mobile and shareable across those boundaries, even they're, though they're invisible, really does directly impact the patient experience. Awesome. Before I move off patient experience, any other comments on this one? I think the flexibility of your image sharing platform um, with the anonymizing or with your, your viewer just being very agnostic and being able to be used by anyone is huge. Um, we've had that multiple times. You get a disc, you know, a lot of people are trying to encrypt the disc now. Sometimes you can't unencrypt them. But when you really have an imaging sharing platform like Ombra that's able to, you know, get through a coral assessment with flying colors because their security is also there for the patient and for the physician, it's, it really is huge. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. So how can proponents of cloud-based healthcare solutions promote adoption of the cloud within their organizations? I feel like I'm often having conversations, you know, technology is obviously a really key component of a lot of the change we're going to be able to see operationally and for the experience of an organization, but technology is only one piece of it. Adoption and buy-in and utilization of the various users who range from your patients to your referring physicians to your film room staff is important in really making whatever solution you deploy successful at the end of the day. So I would be, I'd be curious to hear how both of you have sort of driven and promoted the adoption um, at your organizations or just what you've seen has worked um, as it relates to adoption um, kind of in your experience. And Amina, we'll start with you on this one. Sure, so I often try and get people to think about their loved ones. Um, I don't know anyone who would not want their loved one's um, data shared, you know, quickly, seamlessly, efficiently, if they were, say, going through 
aortic rescue, um, stroke transfers, and just think about how seamlessly you want this to, um, you know, be not just for your patients, but if that was your loved one. Right. That, that level of empathy that you can, that you can um, sort of arouse in people is, I think, really important. I know at Ombra, one of our favorite things is hearing patient stories and stories from our customers about how the technology that we're so in the weeds on has impacted the patient care of an individual, and it's very motivating for us. Um, so that's actually a great approach that I hadn't really thought of before. Um, Elise, what about at St. Luke's? You guys are doing a lot. What are you doing to drive adoption over there? Yeah, it's it's great because I actually reached out to our our lead uh, IT cloud uh, product solution um, uh, gentleman, and you know he said you got to get executive buy-in. You know, you say this word cloud, executives are like, well, what does that even mean? They can't, it's not tangible to them. So because it's not tangible, they're like, I'm not giving you X amount of money to start a cloud migration. I don't know what, I don't understand. And then you have to get down in the weeds of the money, right? You, you An on-prem server, a VM server versus cloud, what does that look like? And then it has to come from an executive leadership um, level you know to to really have that buy-in um from an organization and you know here at st luke's we are a microsoft azure uh full full-fledged we've started this a while ago um and i know people that are on this call um maybe with their pax vendor are in the cloud or are not in the cloud or doing a hybrid we just started migrating we have been in um had our packs up and running since december of 2004 we've done no and i know it's another question Chantel, that's coming up but we've done no purging of images um so we're moving that entire data to microsoft azure and then we're also talking about um having that data in our cloud meaning st luke's university health networks cloud but allowing other vendors to attach their front end to that cloud in order to keep us having the ownership of the data because data ownership is another big cloud discussion. Um, because if you go with a vendor that has a cloud and you end up in their cloud, how do you get that data back mm -hmm. if you decide to cut ties with that vendor. So I think it's like, like once you get a cloud infrastructure team at your organization and then get the, the governance around that cloud and what that looks like, I think it kind of all falls into play. But um, Matt, who I'm referring to that I spoke to, he was very funny. He goes, don't tell anybody you're putting it in the cloud. And then when they say, wow, everything has been working so great lately, then you tell them that you put it in the cloud because they're not any of the wiser. So I thought his comment was kind of comical. But it really does work. If people don't know it's there, but they have no latency, they have no issues where it's stored, it really doesn't affect the end user as long as your cloud system that you're installing on, it really is tested, tr try and true tested, and you you are testing the bandwidth and you do have that disaster recovery cloud set up. So you sort of answered my follow up question before I had a chance to ask it, which is what are the typical pushbacks you see on the cloud and how do you overcome that? I think latency is definitely one security is another. Yeah. But um, once I think people, there's a reluctance, but if you can get people using it and they see that there is none of that present, you can help get buy in a lot more quickly. Well, and I can tell you from our perspective, because we have so much many terabytes of data. It, it's a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight because you can't even get it up there quickly, let alone worry about pulling it down, right? So right now here at St. Luke's, we are writing all our new exams to the cloud. Um, okay. They're still on an STS, so we're in a little bit of a hybrid uh, scenario at this point, which I think most organizations are comfortable with that uh, short-term storage solution plus the cloud um, for latency. But eventually we, we look to be full totally in the cloud. So it, it'll be exciting once we get there. That's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, Amina, I guess I'll ask you the question that Elise already answered, but when it comes to adoption of the cloud and, and developing um, proponents for the cloud, have you faced any challenges or wh what are the challenges or, or pushbacks you see most frequently? And then what are your suggestions on how to overcome that? I think when dealing with outside facilities, um, I've often had to discuss the security. Um, um, guys mentioned, um, we let them know that it is secure, um, the data is encrypted, um, and then just kind of to promote the use of the cloud. Um, sometimes, well, in-house anyway, we'll provide demonstrations. Like this is the manual, you know, process using, you know, on-site um, servers, and this is how it works. Um, how much quicker it works with the cloud. Yeah. And I'm proving that it is secure. Yep. 
It's a great, uh, great approach to promoting things is always by assessing and examining the alternative and putting that in front of people. So that is awesome. Any other comments on adoption of cloud or challenges of implementing the cloud um, from either of you before we move on? All right, we'll keep moving. Oh, we have a quick poll before we jump into our next question. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. What do you consider? So for the folks out there that are um, working with a cloud vendor today, what do you consider the best benefit of working with the cloud vendor? Is it predictable monthly fees, seamless upgrades, reliable support, partnership and customization, or all of the above? And maybe while we're gathering some answers, I can turn it to my two uh, panelists. Uh, Amina, if you had to pick one of these, what, what, would, what would be the biggest benefit of working with a cloud vendor from your perspective? Can I say all of the above? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, that's, I'll take it for sure. Um, are there any that stand out to you as being particularly um, more top of mind than others? I really enjoy anything that um, when we can partner, um, collaborate and customize. Yeah. We love to have things customized, um, which is very important. While we need um, interoperability standards, you know, international across the board, um, at your facility, you know, the way you're ingesting um, data and let's say converting the demographic mismatches from an outside facility to your facility, um, the ability to be able to customize um, even the retention period. Yeah. Elise, what about you? Um, at St. Luke's, we're all about the partnerships. We do enjoy our partnerships. Um, my thing is, is I think eventually some partnerships might dissolve if you don't go to the cloud. Um, I think you have to look towards the future. The future is people don't want to buy on-prem. They don't want to buy the, the storage anymore. They want to go to that predicted monthly fee, right? They want to know, okay, I'm taking X, Y, and Z to the cloud. It's only going to be 50 more dollars a month, you know? Um, so I think all of the above, definitely. Um, but I think that um, the partnership and the predictable monthly fees are a big um, point of contention with um, a big health network. Um, reliable support that, again, any vendor, you got to wait and see if that really is there. You know, uh, I think whoever you partner with, as they get bigger and bigger, their support tends to go one way or the other. So I think that reliable support will be seen definitely in the future. Most definitely. Uh, it looks like the majority of our of the listeners did reply all of the above um, with a, a little bit more emphasis on the reliable support. So to echo at least what you just said, I think another great benefit, which I think does kind of go along with predictable monthly fees is also the scalability of the cloud um, with a lot of movement happening in the healthcare space with M&A. Um, it's nice to be able to, if you acquire a hospital, at least we were just talking about this, be able to uh, properly resource what you're going to need more easily when it's in the cloud versus um, you're dealing with an on-prem solution where it's a, a lot more rigid. Yep. All right. Yep. The next question. Um, again, talking about interoperability, what are the biggest barriers to interoperability um, that you've encountered and how did you overcome them? Um, Elise, I will start with you. So, I'm starting to tackle my barriers <laughs> um, recently, um, but we just rolled out a brand new workflow with FHIR and um, Ombra and Epic. Um, uh, my interoperability comes from, again, I think I spoke about this earlier, the seamless physician experience, the seamless patient experience. Is the vendor willing to work with a vendor that I wanna work with in order to bring two things together? And I think um, recently Ombra's got into the app orchard with Epic, which then uh, um, allowed Epic to open those doors to work uh, tirelessly. Um, we actually just rolled out ultrasound bedside procedure. Point of care ultrasound is a big point. I see a lot of articles on that. I didn't believe. I didn't realize how as I was going through it, how many other people are, are going through it also. So the the awesome workflow that we rolled out with the point of care ultrasound, it just, it, it tells you where the interoperability can take you for multiple things. OR video is another one that I'm going to be tackling in the future. How do I get OR videos not to be shared on some hard drive attached to an OR device? Um, but, you know, 
it, it takes time. Uh, people have to understand, you know, they want it overnight, but to be able to take a vendor and get it to um, the cloud, you have to have that interoperability piece. And then, you know, DICOM standards are changing. So do you want to go along with those DICOM standards? Are you stuck using your old DICOM standards? So I think it's, it's about the people that can think outside the box. I think it's the vendors that want to collaborate. And I also think it's, it's about um, the end result and is the end result what your governance of your institution is looking for. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure we could spend an entire webinar talking about the challenges or um, of governance and how that plays into deploying a lot of these new workflows. Yeah. Um, and I know I mean, we've talked about it a lot. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know about you, but when I start dabbling into point of care ultrasounds, I'm getting out of my radiology space. I'm getting out of my cardiology space. So now I'm starting to deal, deal with people that even don't understand what I do and what I'm trying to do for them. So it's also that communication piece of what the interoperability can do for them. Um, really, um, uh, it's interesting, I can say, I've, I've, but it's challenging and I love it. Just like Maura said in the beginning to have those challenges um, in something that we all love to do is, is it makes going to work every day great. I'm sure as you're branching out to these other groups, it's, it's just this consistent educational initiative on even letting people know what's possible when it comes to interoperability because Huge. It, it's changing yeah. constantly. What's possible tomorrow is not necessarily what's possible today. And so always kind of having those conversations over and over again, I'm sure is very important in what you've done as you've sort of moved outside of your sphere. Totally correct, yep. yep. Amina, what um, about you? Just saying, and continually to educate those groups. So I started off um, as an x-ray tech, and then um, when I got into informatics, I was just doing radiology. Um, now I'm part of a clinical imaging group. So it's you know radiology, cardiology, pathology, um, and, you know, something that was new to me a couple years ago were TIFF images um, and just being able to, you know, electronically share those and working with vendors to make sure that we have that, um, we didn't cut across that interoperability, um, you know, barrier. Um, I also think that one of the biggest barriers that I still encounter today, um, even when we receive studies uh, electronically, um, is sometimes the ability to be able to view and store them. Um, we have images taken on proprietary formats. Uh, we have people using private tags or retired DICOM stock classes. Um, and when it comes to the private tags and retired stock classes, sometimes we can filter those out, um, but it's time consuming. Um, it can be a bit of a challenge if it's not already um, set up. And it's something that I think we all need to still consider and keep them with the standards. Totally. And Amina, you've, you've most likely had such a unique perspective kind of having the path that you've had and really kind of sitting in the shoes of different types of folks in your organization. How has that made you think about how you can best educate other folks um, on sort of the challenges and benefits that you were just talking about? So I'm often on calls and in meetings and on site with both clinical and technical staff. And because I stepped into both worlds, I do feel a little bit more comfortable, um, you know, speaking to each and kind of, you know, driving that link. I definitely believe that, you know, we all need to work together. So you would never want um, just someone um, clinical or just someone technical making the decision um, on software or hardware um, and, you know, workflow. So it's about, you know, bridging those gaps. That's yep. such a good point. All right, in the interest of time, because I do want to leave some room for questions, I'm going to jump to question number six. We touched on this a little bit, but do you think the international data sharing standards are compatible with the interoperability needs of today? Uh, Amina, we'll have you kick this one off. So we discussed this at, you know, Rite Aid all the time, um, where, you know, we believe the world is working towards greater alignment, but you know, global collaboration just isn't there yet. Um, so despite having international standards, um, there's organizations um, that need to continue to improve. And then you have different, um, you know, barriers uh, such as regulatory privacy and cultural barriers um, in low and medium income countries. The cultural barriers piece is such a fantastic point. It's often one I know I uh, consider last. Uh, you know, we think about the, the the regulatory, we think about the different issues or regulatory issues for different pockets of the world. 
but really considering the cultural environment that these um, workflows are being implemented in is equally important as well. Um, that's an awesome point. Uh, Elise, from your perspective, um, are international data sharing standards compatible with the needs of today? Yeah, I, you know, I know we get uh, CD still from the, you know, people that come over um, from the third world countries and we're not able to ingest those images. So I think there is definitely a big barrier between um, that kind of interoperability. And I think until we figure it out here in our country, you're probably not going to see those standards come come too close. Great. Anything else on international data sharing standards before we move on to our final scripted question for, for today? All right, we'll keep moving. I'm, I'm really aiming to have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end, so pardon my speed towards the end here. All right, finally, uh, uh, as imaging volumes, patient data in general, continues to grow, how does your organization plan to store and manage your data? I know we've touched upon this a bit just in the previous questions, but we can kind of dedicate the time. I'd love to hear about, you know, imaging data and also data beyond that, what the plans are today and what the plans are, you know, medium term and long term. Um, to be really fascinated by. So, Elise, I know you touched on this a little bit. Why don't we get started with you? Such a loaded question. <laughs> We'd love to know all the people that are listening out there what you guys are doing because I can tell you um, our uh, assistant chief radiologist wants it all and then he could get in the room with the lawyer and the lawyer says no you don't want it all. So there, there there's a very especially when it comes to imaging um, you know, if, if a radiologist has an image from, let's just say, January 15th of 2005, the patient presented, and now the patient shows up today, would he look at it? Sure he would, um, if he had it. Um, so it becomes a, 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 a state question, right? Each state, we're in Jersey and Pennsylvania, each state has their different laws. The Jersey law is different than the Pennsylvania law. We have to look at that data separately. Right. And then on top of that, you have to then really have signatures, have a signature paper with people signing off, whether it's the lawyer, the radiologist, uh, whether it's the, the clinical physician. Um, everybody's got a different opinion. So I think it's one of those things that, um, like I said, I would love to hear the people out there, what their thoughts are and what their organizations are doing. Um, we just purchased a hospital uh, recently and they had done purging. Um, it was the first time I came across anybody that had purged images. Um, so they, they had been bought twice within a, maybe a six year period and their first uh, hospital, the first people that purchased them did purge the images before they sent them to the second hospital. So again, um, it's just very interesting on how um, p different people are just doing different things. I mean, I'm not really sure what you guys are doing at Penn, but um, we're not really, we're just dabbling in it now. We're trying to get the, the laws down. We're trying to figure out, and that it includes not just imaging, but uh, medical records and all that stuff. Yes, um, we are also not purging at Penn. Um, there are, you know, works to move certain um, files and data to cold storage. Mm -hmm. um, but actually one of the most fascinating, um, you know, ways and examples that I can think of, you know, managing cloud data and storage is again with Red Aid, where uh, the Red Aid Friendship Hacks is a hybrid hacks that stores images both locally um, and on the cloud, um, a cloud-based web server. So when we first arrived to, um, you know, UCH um, in Nigeria, we discovered that they had recently lost 22,000 images um, on some damage on site um, hard drives. Um, but now, since we have the on site um, server that mirrors the cloud server, it acts as a backup, which I thought was amazing. So it'll never, or at least it significantly decreases the possibility of losing images in the future. The hybrid model is definitely an interesting one. Um, but it's especially in a situation like that, you can see how beneficial that would be. Um, you have the local storage if you need the speed, and then you have the backup option in the cloud for the retention and the guarantee that the imaging will be there. Yes. Um, so I guess I'm looking at the clock. I want to make sure that, well, we have a quick poll. So I, uh, before we jump into any of the live Q and A, um, sort of, uh, tailing off our previous question, does your organization have a plan in place to 
store and manage healthcare data um, sort of I think with future advances. So options are yes, we are already working with a vendor to expand our capabilities. We are thinking about putting a, pan, a plan in place to expand. And third, no, we do not have plans to expand data management. And, and so Elise, it sounds like you guys are kind of working through this right now, um, you know, thinking through all the constraints and considerations. And also, you know, we've purchased a couple of hospitals in the past three years and what do you do with their data? Right. Now you have somebody else's data that you now own. So you have to figure out what to do with that data. So do you move it to a unified platform for legal purposes only? Do the physicians need access to it? So it gets, it really does get messy. Yeah. yeah. And Amina at, at Penn, how are you guys thinking about managing healthcare data in the future? Or are you thinking about it currently? Yes, there's currently, um, you know, it's like a daily topic. Um, how exactly do you manage that data? Um, as Elise said, um, when you acquire uh, another outside facility, do you begin by the um, set of go live um, to view the images, you know, in your current environment and have like a cutoff date and have the other um, studies retrievable by, you know, DNA storage? Um, so these are like continuing questions as we continue to grow and as data gets larger and larger. And again, um, we're implementing cold storage. Very interesting. So just some quick results on our poll and then we'll jump into some additional questions with our, with our final few minutes here. Looks like 61% of people, uh, of attendees are already working with a vendor to expand their capabilities. So really interesting to see. Um, all right, so I'm, I would be, uh, we have to talk about AI. We just have to. Uh, I know we mentioned it in the beginning and we haven't gotten to it yet. So question would be, do you foresee the adoption of AI happening more rapidly in the healthcare space now that we are living in this virtual world? And I'd even just love to hear anecdotally some of the things that you all are seeing from your perspective at your respective organizations. Um, Amina, why don't we start with you? Yes, AI is one of my favorite topics. Um, so yes, I do believe that we'll, um, you know, start seeing it a lot more. There are, you know, a lot of vendors and a lot of in-house, um, you know, products and things coming out, but it's really all about how you approach it. You want to make sure you do a proper evaluation. You want to make sure it meets your standards. And um, one of the most important things is you want to make sure you provide education and training. So uh, in 2017, you know, Rad Aid uh, begun a radiology residency program in Guyana. And two years ago, so in 2019, they actually began to start some training initiatives um, so that the residents could have AI education in order to use AI decision support for breast imaging. Um, and then with my work at Penn as part of the you know, AI steering committee, uh, we're consistently, you know, evaluating, um, you know, AI um, products and then testing them out. Um, I think this is not going away anytime soon and we need to adapt as quickly as possible. There are also the two new IHE um, profiles that center around AI and data management. Um, Elise, from your perspective, AI, you know, it's, it has it accelerated. I think governance is the big thing. So we're, again, just starting to dabble. But what AI are you looking at? Are you looking at um, something to for the CT of the head to rule out, you know, occlusion? Are you looking at, we are piloting an AI project with um, one of our uh, vendors uh, on a portable ultrasound for uh, PE, you know, or pneumothorax. Um, and that, that AI is more on the software of the portable machine going to the PAC system. It's not a true AI, or what do you call a true AI? And these are all the discussions now that are going around. And I think um, you have some people that are really gung-ho on AI that want to buy it tomorrow. But as Amina said, you have to do the research. You have to even evaluate the company. Is this a company you can hang your hat on? You know, um, so it's very interesting and and 
the question is who's more important the neurology service line is it is it the the you know like the cancer care service line like w what are you trying to do with the ai is really what i've kind of questioned my governance back on and say okay yeah i'm 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 let's go we're in um and then the other aspect is is selling the data for ai, AI companies you know i've met now with three different ai companies who are using the breast imaging um for certain to market certain ais willing to give you their product for free if you give them the data so you get into all these uh, weird caveats but again um, just like with enterprise imaging at your organization it's governance you have to have governance behind it or you're stuck in this rabbit hole um, talking to people but going nowhere so yeah AI is certainly a very broad topic it ranges yeah. from diagnostic applications to efficiency operational applications and so I can imagine that from your, both of your perspective, trying to evaluate and prioritize, in addition to thinking about all the considerations around regulatory issues, partnering with the right company, et cetera, um, there's a lot to consider before being able to really truly green light and move forward with the solution. Agreed. Um, so uh, we ha have about four minutes left. I wanna be mindful of time and we have some really great questions. I apologize if I'm not getting, that I will not be able to get to all of them. But I will try to paraphrase a question, kind of a setup and a question that just came in. It looks like, you know, we have somebody who's, who's, um, who's listening in, who is sort of an independent hospital system that has numerous requests to bring outside imaging into, into their packs. Um, they do use a vendor, but there are costs associated with it. Um, they're sort of thinking through ownership and responsibility for, for those images. Um, and sort of what the differing needs are with different types of imaging coming in. So the question is, with that background, any suggestions on where to reduce, co reduce costs in areas as they increase costs to implement new technology? Um, what factors should they focus on um, as priorities to help manage costs as they shift perspectives to support more and more interoperability of the types of solutions that we just discussed? Um, Elise, why don't we start with you? Any recommendations on how to, you know, that's basically make room for investment? <laughs> that's definitely a question. Um, you know, and, and I say this, I said, you know, alignment with the right vendor really does make a difference, right? You, you need somebody to, that understands your health institution. You need somebody that understands um, the way, the way uh, your governance thinks. And, and when you get people that are that somebody that comes in to sell you x y and z and when you when you as the person they're selling to tells them what the end result is and you never get to that end result then you then you're, you're you're back at square one so it's really vetting the people that are trying to get you to whatever your end result is and make sure they're in it with you um, I, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've been radiology 25 years this year, you know, my big, uh, quarter Congratulations. century. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I started when I was, uh, 19. So, um, I just, I think everything I've seen through my um, adventures here at St. Luke's is, you know, you just really have to know what your end result is and hold people accountable. And and with that accountability will, will come that cost savings. Um, I hope that makes sense to whoever asked the question. Um, but on another note too, I think you have to have a plan in place. You have to have the people to support it because you're, if you, Think it's going to be cheap and then you find out you don't have um, somebody to do the training or you don't have somebody to do the implementation correctly it winds up costing you more money in the long run if that makes right. sense that's such a good point Amina any comments to kind of close us out um, I uh, definitely agree I think it um, comes down to really governance in this situation you are essentially um, usually when making something more efficient opening up the floodgates to receive more data. Um, you know, I know at Penn, we started off with approximately 3,500 outside studies a month. And then when we got, um, you know, integrated and automated system to reconcile the studies, um, we're upwards of 20,000 um, some months. Um, so then we had to decide, like, so we're currently, you know, storing everything, but does the institution want to store 20 chest x-rays that the patient brought in um, that we know the physician may only look at the most recent few and perhaps the earliest. But now that we have them, are we responsible for them? So I think it's a legal and ethical question. Yeah. That's a great point. 
we are right at time. Um, and so I want to take a couple seconds again to thank Elise and Amina and Morris uh, for just a fantastic conversation. Uh, I feel like I could continue on for a while. We've got a lot of questions coming in, but I do want to be mindful. So once again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you for everybody um, who tuned in today. We looks like we had a great, uh, a great audience, a very engaged audience, so we're really appreciative. Uh, the final thing I'll say is if you do want to connect additionally with anybody on the Ombre Health team, I have here on, on the screen some virtual events that we will be at. Um, we will uh, kind of look to engage with, with everybody there. So Chic, uh, See Mimi, um, and RSNA, of course, uh, RSNA 2020. So thank you, everybody, uh, for a fantastic um, webinar. And we hope to see you all again on an event in the future soon. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you.